The Cannabis Conversation. A European perspective on the emerging legal cannabis industry. Welcome to the Cannabis Conversation with Anuj Desai, where we explore the new legal cannabis industry by speaking to the professionals that are helping to shape it. So I'm back from holiday, back from the Ardèche in France, which was absolutely beautiful and I would highly recommend. Followed hot on the heels by Product Earth, which was this weekend up in near Coventry. It was fantastic and I'll talk a bit more about it at the end of the show, but uh, a really great event. Coming up today, we've got Harry Gugliani from Grow Biotech, who'll be talking to us about medical cannabis in the UK. Unfortunately, the recording came out a bit like it was a phone call, which was not expected, but hopefully the content is good. Enjoy. Okay, today we've got Harry Gugliani on the show. Harry is COO of Grow Biotech, which is one of the leading medical cannabis companies in the UK and at the forefront of getting medical cannabis to patients in the UK. Uh, Harry's an ex-lawyer like myself and has made the jump to a kind of more entrepreneurial game. So it'd be great to hear from him on a number of levels. Welcome, Harry. Brilliant. Hi, thanks very much. Yeah, no worries, no worries. I've been trying to get you on the show for a while, but I'm now glad that you're doing some media, so thanks for agreeing to do this. Yeah, no problem. I think your show's doing really, really well. I think it provides some quite good insight into the into the industry and all the different moving parts, and so I've been enjoying listening to, to some of the episodes myself. No worries, that's great to hear. Thanks, Harry. Cool, okay, well, let's uh, let's get straight into it. Maybe worth having a bit of a brief recap on what the law is in relation to medical cannabis, obviously, there were announcements made last November, but what's actually happening? So, um, I mean, I guess from a from a very high level, medical cannabis is now legal and permitted in the UK. However, many patients or many of the people who've been using cannabis for medical or therapeutic reasons for a long time are really frustrated because there isn't the, the widespread access to medical cannabis that they'd hoped for or that they've been campaigning for. So, at the moment. Medical cannabis is available if a specialist consultant decides that, so that's a, a senior doctor in a particular field, decides that they think it might be appropriate for one of their patients. So that automatically restricts the number of people who who are able to write a prescription for medical mm. cannabis because obviously that excludes GPs and obviously it excludes people who are still relatively early in their in their career in developing specialist knowledge. But it, it does make sense when you dig into it and you and you try and think about the rationale for why it's there. So legally specialist consultants can write prescriptions, but at the moment the NHS isn't uh, supporting medical cannabis. And the main reasons for that have been set out recently in a nice report so the National Institute for Care and Excellence. Uh, and, and the report effectively says, first of all, there isn't enough data for us to generally say, yes, we think medical cannabis makes sense for mm. the NHS uh, as a whole. And second, where there is some data uh, in relation to very specific products, the cost benefit analysis doesn't make it make sense for patients. So mm. the end result is that uh, the patients who've been campaigning for many years, the people who have been relying on the black market are, are unsatisfied because they don't have access to it in the way that they would other medicine. That's a great little summary there. I mean, if we talk about the report to begin with, my reading of the report that was a fairly kind of conservative approach to this particular issue, what's your kind of insight on that and as a business were you quite disappointed in in the outcome of that report so as a business we we've answered questions from nice during the last few months to to try and give them some insight into how the cost of medical cannabis in a in a private setting which is where all the prescriptions are at the moment how that cost ends up being what it is and so we were not surprised by the approach um the sort of the areas that they were looking at being realistic it's not unreasonable for the position that NICE are taking. They, they haven't said, no, this is not, you know, we'll never consider this. What they've yeah. said is we need, we need to develop evidence. So the way, there are a couple of different ways that you could look at gathering evidence and mm -hmm. 
the traditional method that uh, people might use if they wanted to normally launch a, a medicine into a market is they go through a clinical trial process where they have, you know, they'll, they'll control it and maybe have some patients on a placebo and some patients on the real medication and try and show efficacy that way. And then there is, there's another way that people sometimes demonstrate efficacy, which is through observational trials. So patients will sign up to a trial, which means that they, they test out the medication and then data is gathered that people can then compare and contrast and see how effective the medicine is. So where we're at now, I think, is the law does allow patients who can afford to go and see private consultants who are working in the areas where medical cannabis appears to be most relevant. So if they can, if they can pay the private consultation and they can pay the, the, the fee of buying the medicine themselves, they can access it. But the second piece of it is that the legislation um, almost provides a route through for clinical studies to be done in the UK. And what it appears nice and the regulators and uh, policymakers are looking for is evidence that's developed within a clinical setting within the UK. There's a, there's a lot of interesting things there. It's, it's understandable that NICE have perhaps reached their conclusions based on their existing and legacy way of thinking and approaching uh, medicine in the UK. Does there need to be a change in the way that they do that? Do they need to start being more open to this um, kind of observational stuff that you were talking about? One of the key things that underpins the approach that the healthcare system is based on is that no doctor should be causing harm to any of their patients. So yeah. the first question that people rightfully have is, is this safe or not? Now, people who've been using cannabis for the last few years to, to help them with their, their condition will say, well, look, obviously it's safe and it's a lot safer than brain surgery or many of the alternatives or, or potentially even opioids. But I guess the, the, the key is that we need that clinical data that, that shows safety. One of the big complexities that I've learned about and that people talk about with cannabis is that we're not talking about a single chemical compound and the effect that has. Mm. We're, we're talking about a plant that has tens of compounds in them and from one plant to the next, within a batch, from batch to batch of the same strain, you end up with varying levels of those cannabinoids. Mm -hmm. And so that's an additional level of complexity. Combined with the suggestion that I believe is out there, that different people's bodies react differently to, this, let's say, they have identical um, cannabinoid profiles or identical strains. So... Mm -hmm. um, so I think it is, it, it is a complex area, and I think that there will need to be some allowance taken for the fact that this is cannabis. Uh, yeah. and, and also the fact that this is not something that's a new discovery, obviously. So there are people up and down the country using cannabis for medical or therapeutic reasons um, that they've, you know, self-medicating. There are people also using it for recreational or, or leisure or, or whatever other reason as well. So maybe the approach uh, that, that needs to be taken is a little bit more sympathetic to, to that scenario. So I think the conclusion that many people are coming to in the UK is we can't, we can't hide from the fact that doctors would like evidence. They'd like facts. They'd like to understand what they're telling their patients to, to go away and put into their bodies and what, what the consequences of that would be. We had a previous guest on, um, and I can't recall which was the guest, but it was almost talking about creating a new category of medicine for cannabis, just for, for a number of the reasons that you, you outlined. Um, mainly because of the just the sheer quantity of active compounds in it and the the kind of possible uh, variations and combinations of those. It may all, almost require a new model of thinking in relation to this um, to sort of help it progress. I think, yeah, and I think, I think that's possible. And I think doctors who are paving the way in the UK are not just following a tried and tested process. They're, they're looking at it and they're, they're using their 
their experience and their skill set to assess patients and to, to continually learn. So, so I, I do think that what we'll end up with is a is a process that that takes into account all the complexities, takes into account the black market and the availability, but ultimately it's going to need to satisfy the requirements that it's safe, that it works, and that ultimately it's a cost-effective way of achieving you know, patient outcomes. What do you think fundamentally, if you haven't already said it, to change in the UK to, to get this more widespread? Do you think it's, it's the tests that are the real blocker or are there any other factors? I think there's a couple of things, I think. So one of them, first of all, we just need clinical data collected in the UK, and that will happen as... Doctors become more comfortable with cannabis. You know, we're seeing that. We're seeing doctors that were had no previous interest are now becoming interested and then looking at prescribing. And I think that will help. I think building out clinical data will will help significantly. I think the other issue that we see is because of the rapid expansion of cannabis, both from a medical perspective but also uh, from a recreational perspective in North America uh, specifically. The, the rate of expansion of the market is is just too fast for companies to keep up with. <laughs> so there, you know, we, you, you, you wouldn't have to look very hard to see plenty of examples in other countries where there have been serious shortages of, of products. So I think one of the other issues that the UK has faced is that because it's a young and emerging market, it hasn't necessarily had access to a range of products that are going to be reliably and consistently available. So that's something that we've been working on very hard at Grow Biotech uh, with our partners, RPS Pharma, uh, to, to make sure that when we bring on board new products, they are going to be available consistently and reliably and to challenge. And I think we will see that challenge falling away relatively quickly because there's a lot of work being done across Europe and other parts of the world to make sure that mm. the supply is met. And so when you say products, do you mean flour or do you mean oils or do you mean pills that have cannabis compounds in them? Yeah, all, all of the above. All of the above. Um, there, there's a huge range of uh, potential products out there. So flour is the one that people most naturally associate with cannabis. Um, many people will now be aware of oils, which are effectively extracts of the cannabis flower. And that's typically used where people can't sit and vaporize a flower. In some countries, there are people with vaporizer devices similar to e-cigarettes. So you have a liquid and you can vaporize that way. But we're also seeing pills that if you, if you put them out on a, on a counter, you would have no idea that it's got anything to do with cannabis. It would look like just any other generic pharmaceutical. Um, mm. And so I think we are seeing some companies really trying to take on that challenge of making cannabis like a pharmaceutical. Yeah, yeah. I, think, I imagine from a psychological perspective, the idea of a pill, which is we're, we're all very comfortable with, probably changes your approach to it. But uh, that's probably a topic for another day. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, quickly, when you talk about what sort of things are Grow Biotech doing to sort of help, you've talked about a couple of those things in terms of bringing products into the country. Um, are you guys doing anything else? Yeah, so the the bit of the business that I work on is focused on solving the issue of the fact that medical cannabis is now legal but there are all sorts of hurdles that people have to address. Um, they might be, from a purely logistic point of view, uh, getting the product into the country and then delivering it to a patient or to their pharmacy. But also, this is a new class of medicine and doctors don't know anything about it. So consultants will ask uh, for information on products and we have a team of people that are from a pharmaceutical background, so have done this with all sorts of other medical products or devices who are able to then give information to the doctors in a way that they understand. So we, in, in that regard, we are trying to provide a effectively a turnkey solution that helps doctors go from interested in cannabis to having satisfied patients. And I was on a phone earlier this morning to one of the doctors who uh, 
you know uses our services and has prescribed our products as, as well as products other products that that um haven't come through us and that doctor likes the service we provide because they know it's compliance they know that we provide a next day delivery service to patients um so patients get their medicine delivered at home the day after they've seen their consultant but today i was told by that doctor that one patient has now completely come off their opioids fantastic as a consequence of the medication and the consultation that that doctor's been been having with that patient which is which is really very exciting and i think it's just a sign of maybe the potential so we're not we don't make products uh, ourselves we look to finished products because um we want to see products that have been used in other countries and that have that have got evidence behind them for particular indications or particular conditions and we package up the information that's needed so that as and when doctors want that information we're there to support them as well as helping them with the um all of the red tape that's involved with starting to prescribe a controlled substance so mm. that that's that but then the other side of our business is research and development which naturally people think is to do with making new products it isn't it's actually looking at the issues that we've already talked about a little bit around cannabis and its complexity and taking you know what is fundamentally is a, a plant that has been bred and um over many many years for a particular purpose and has a number of issues like the consistency of the chemical compounds or or other things and and so our research and development is around finding tools or processes that would enable cannabis to have a better medical outcome for patients mm. that's great i mean i think uh and it sounds like a very smart move um from a lot of the stuff that i've been reading i've been seeing a lot that says that you know owning ip in this industry is going to be crucial to sort of winning really <laughs> um <laughs> Uh, rather than just growing or having huge capacity of land, etc., it's about. Uh, I mean, look, this quite a categorical statement, but uh, yeah. <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's going to be really key to expanding your business. Well, I, I also think just to pick up on that, if you look at most other industries, people specialise in what they do, and people buy in expert services, and they buy in machinery or tools or assets that help them do something in the way that they're. You know they've been focused on doing what they do so mm. cultivation is a real skill and then um processing the 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 flower once you've cultivated is also a real skill and then at the other end of it you've got the the doctors who are interacting with patients and the you know the nurses and the the, the clinic managers and the people that interact with patients and make all of that uh, an experience that, that mm. makes them want to come back so i think um it's just another part of it but our view is that um it's an area that not enough people are looking at so it it provides a big opportunity but also means we can have quite a big impact i think yeah yeah innovation sounds great yeah. um cool okay well thank you for that harry um and that's a, it's a good rundown and on what's happening generally but also about how grow is helping um to sort of progress the the uk medical sector um maybe we could talk a little bit about yourself so as i mentioned at the top of the show um you are a lawyer much like myself yeah, uh, and much like that. myself uh, <laughs> you've been trying to shed that label for a while um, we're, we're both recovering lawyers it's, we're uh... both recovering lawyers indeed um so yeah what, what, what tell us a bit about your personal story what were you doing before and what prompted you to sort of move into this area i trained and uh, worked as a corporate lawyer in london so i found it really interesting looking at different businesses that were being bought or sold or raising money or whatever they were doing but i kind of wanted to be on the other end of the phone um and so i moved in house to a fund for a little while but it, it wasn't really scratching the itch that I had to go and do something a bit more entrepreneurial, a bit more business focused, and where yeah. I felt a little bit closer to the out, you know, the end outcome yeah. of what you were doing. I came home from work one day and just had enough, so I sat down and, uh, you know, as you know, lawyers don't like spreadsheets, so <laughs> I did get a spreadsheet up and fumbled my way around it and worked out how long I could survive with the money in my bank account, 
And I didn't resign the next day, but I made the decision and I, I, I resigned pretty soon after that without, yeah. without really a plan. Um, so I spent a few years consulting in a range of different industries and different roles from running solo transactions to working on a few startups. I did some crisis management type work uh, in, with all sorts of different companies. And I, and both legal and non-legal type work? Um, uh, well, I tried to stay away from legal as much as possible. Uh, mm. Quite often the route in would be through the legal background, but I, mm. I yeah, really tried to stay away from that. Um, and so I did that for a while. And somebody I had worked with, who you know, who you've interviewed, Tom Gray, um, told me he was leaving his job to join the cannabis industry. And I didn't really know what he was talking about. <laughs> um, uh, so that he happens got... most of the time with Tom, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, no, I was, I was just sort of a bit surprised because my perception of cannabis was TV shows, North America, people, you know, saying that they had a medical cannabis card, but really it wasn't medical at all. I had no idea about all of the you know, really genuine and sincere uh, medical claims that people have made around cannabis for, for a really long time. But so I came along, got involved a little bit with um, seeing some of the early stage companies. I went to a few events and started to see the caliber of people that were involved across, uh, with a huge range of skill sets. So whether that's scientists or uh, people with a sort of political or lobbying background through to uh, the level of interest from you know, financiers and people like that. And, and I was uh, I was quite interested by it, but more so by this entire area of um, the patient groups that I really just did, I didn't know anything about. So yeah. I decided I'd, uh, I decided I'd sort of stick around. So I did some consult, I did some consultancy work with Grow. Uh, mm -hmm. And that was around about the time that the legislation changed to allow medical cannabis, which was, again, another bit of luck. Um, and so then I uh, was offered a role to come on as the COO. And so I've been, been in it ever since. So it's really a consequence of me looking for something that would be exciting and interesting and uh, a little bit uncharted, uh, the high impact the, the sort of social impact, it was, you know, shouldn't be understated. But in reality, it was just complete luck that this, <laughs> this revolution was going on at the same time as I was looking for something like it. Yeah, that chimes so much with where my experience as well. And I, I kind of feel like you make your luck a bit. Um, it doesn't happen overnight. So that's great. And now we're going to move on to my final and traditional question of yeah. what did your what did your family say when you told them that you were going into the weed business? <laughs> uh, um, well, I say what everyone else says, which is, can I have some free samples? Um, <laughs> no, in, in, so in reality, so my, um, it's quite interesting actually, because my sister works in psychiatry and right. had spent some time at a facility where people are quite, seriously affected and she had witnessed the impact that uh some of the you know skunk on the street can have on people that were otherwise getting their their mental illness under control so she was uh, initially really against it but since then she and i have spent a lot of time talking about it and learning from each other and actually um her views changed to the extent that um, you know, she's seen research and evidence, and is a lot more interested in it, and understands that it isn't just this you know high THC potent super skunk that's uh, mm -hmm. you know that might be out there, uh, but also I, you know I think it's also given me an understanding uh, and a very real understanding that there are risks, obviously, as well with cannabis, yes. and um, that all comes back to the to the sort of safety and efficacy part. Um, with my parents, I think. Um, I mean, I can't really remember. I think it must have been a relatively underwhelming response, you know. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's one of those things, isn't it? You build it up in your head. Um, yes. And I think it's becoming increasingly easier because, uh, you know, some of the people that are in and around the industry now uh, were, were in long before anybody could really imagine it being legal. 
uh, in the UK. I, I, I sort of, you know, got involved just as public perception was starting to change already. And I think we've seen a huge amount, uh, you know, the, the interest level and the, the amount being, dis, you know, the, the amount of people that are, sorry, the number of people that are actually out there uh, talking about cannabis, uh, talking about CBD, talking about other things like that, I think is increasing, which I think makes it a little bit easier for people coming into the industry going forwards. But naturally, there'll always be some stigma, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. We've moved along quite a lot, but there's still obviously quite quite a fair bit to go. I think it's really useful having the London Evening Standard as a positive publication that is uh, putting out some good stuff uh, in relation to cannabis. So that's certainly helping. I think just generally, I think generally people engaging in the debate is a good thing. You know, yeah. I think if we end up with, you know, this paper is pro cannabis, this paper's against cannabis, um, I don't think we'll actually ever get anywhere. Uh, I think we, you know, both sides of the, the discussion should be, should be engaged with, but I think it is great. And I think that the public interest is high. And I think the best thing about it for me is that it, you know, it isn't just people that want to be able to smoke a few joints recreationally or whatever. It's actually, you know, people are really supportive of, of the potential healthcare angles that you get with medical cannabis. Well, a good note to, to end it on. Huh. Uh, thank you, Harry. Um, really, really useful. And glad I finally managed to secure onto the show. This is good. And no doubt, would love to have you back as a guest in the future. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much. And uh, also, you know, I think we need more people like you who are really surfacing what's going on in the industry. Um, for everyone's parents who are maybe a little less, ag- less in favour of it, you know. <laughs> I wholeheartedly agree. Thank you very much, Harry. No, thank you. Cheers. Thanks for joining me for that. I hope you enjoyed the show. Harry's a good friend of mine in the cannabis industry, so I'm very happy to get him on the show. Really interesting what they're doing there. So many challenges still exist, but hopefully companies like Grow Biotech are helping to address those issues. So as I mentioned at the top of the show, this last weekend was Product Earth Festival 2019 up in Stony Park near Coventry. I had an absolutely brilliant time there on so many levels. First, it was great to host the seminar stage. I'd never done that before and it was really good to actually get out in front of people. Hiding behind this mic serves its purpose, but it was good to to be on stage and to meet and interact with people. Secondly was, you know, meeting so many people. I met loads of people through the seminars, but also attendees at the festival. And I particularly enjoyed hanging out with the guys from the Emerald Cup. For those that don't know, the Emerald Cup is the world's premier cannabis competition hosted in California in December. And they were the key sponsors for Product Earth. So they came over in force and it was great hanging out with them. And they gave a load of great talks as well. And thirdly, and probably most importantly, the speakers that were talking about hemp i was really blown away by the story for hemp and it's annoying that there has to be a story for hemp because it's too compelling to ignore with the amazon burning and plus it's going through the roof we really need to look at alternative sustainable products and that hemp is just so incredible on thousands of levels so expect a lot more pro hemp information from me over the next few weeks and i'll be getting a few more guests on to speak about that if you liking the show please can you subscribe it really really help me if you can can you also share and like and do all those things you can do right now if you if you want and i'd be forever grateful okay until next week have a good one 